So we are going to talk about the infinite sum 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, and so on to infinity. Now one way that we can approach finding the value of this sum is grouping the terms. So I can look at this 1 minus 1 right here and put that in parentheses. And then after that, we'll have another plus 1 minus 1. I can put that in parentheses as well. And after that, we would have a plus 1 minus 1 again. So I can put that group in parentheses. And we can keep doing that to infinity. Now, 1 minus 1 is just equal to 0. So this is a 0. This is also 1 minus 1 is 0. This is a 0, and so on. So we're just adding up infinitely many zeros. And that means that the answer right here is just 0. Now, there's another way that we could group the terms. What I'm going to do is put the first 1 here by itself. So we'll have a 1 out here. And after this 1, there's a minus 1 plus 1. So we could group those two together. So here's the minus 1 plus 1. And after that, after that plus 1, there's another minus 1 plus 1. And after that, there's another minus 1 plus 1. So we can keep doing that to infinity. So this 1 stays as just a 1. But then after that, minus 1 plus 1 is just a 0. And then plus 0, and then plus 0, and so on to infinity. So now we have 1 plus a bunch of zeros. And that's going to leave us with just the value of 1. But wait a minute. The first time we got 0, the second time we got 1, 0 is not equal to 1. So we just tried to evaluate the sum using grouping, and we got two different answers. So it looks like something is going a little bit wrong here. And in this video, I want to talk about why this grouping method for finding the sum doesn't actually give us the right answer for the series 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. Let's start from the beginning. Our goal is to find the value of 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on to infinity. But we don't really know how to add up infinitely many things. We do know how to add up finitely many things. So maybe we should start by taking finite sums and see if that can tell us anything about the infinite sum. So there are infinitely many terms in this series. That's what this dot 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 is saying, is that there are more and more terms out to infinity. But maybe we can start by adding up the first few terms at a time. If we look at just the first term, that's going to be a 1. If we look at the first two terms, we have 1 minus 1, which is just 0. If we look at the first three terms, we have 1 minus 1 plus 1, which is going to be a 1. And after that, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 is 0. And we could keep doing this on to infinity. Now, for each of these sums, we've only added up the first few terms of the series. We've only looked at a part of the infinite sum. So these values right here are called partial sums. They're what we get when we add up the first few terms of a series without adding up all of the infinitely many terms. And we denote the partial sum by Sn, where the number down here in the subscript is the number of terms that we've added up. So in this first example, we only looked at the first term, so that's S1. Here we added up the first two terms, so that's S2. Here's the first three terms, so that's S3. And then the next one is S4, and so on. Now that we have these partial sums, we can start to talk about the infinite sum that we're really trying to find. If this infinite sum has a value, we would kind of expect that as we add up more and more terms in the sequence, the partial sums will get closer and closer to the actual value of the series. So we should be able to get really close to the value of this infinite sum as long as we take a big enough partial sum. So maybe it takes us until s1 billion to get really, really close to that infinite sum. But eventually, we should get there. Now we use that idea that the partial sums 
should get really close to the infinite sum as our definition of the infinite sum. So the way we define the value of this infinite sum up here is we say this infinite sum equals whatever the partial sums approach as n approaches infinity. So if we want to use fancy math language for that, we can say that the value of this sum is the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn. So this is just saying, as we make this subscript really, really big, what value do the partial sums approach? And that's our definition of the infinite sum. So our original problem was about finding a sum of infinitely many numbers. But now that we have this definition of the infinite sum, we can just look at the sequence of partial sums, s1, s2, s3, s4. Those are all just numbers, and we have to figure out what those numbers approach as n approaches infinity. So let's take a look at those partial sums. If we look at s1, we get the value of 1. s2 equals 0, s3 equals 1, s4 equals 0, and if we keep calculating the partial sums, we continue the pattern where we have 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on to infinity. So the partial sums are always going to alternate back and forth between a value of 1 and a value of 0. So if we have this alternating sequence that's just 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on, does this sequence approach any value? Maybe the sequence approaches 1. There are infinitely many 1s in the sequence. Well, the problem with that is there are also infinitely many zeros. And 0 is always a fixed distance away from 1. It's not getting closer at all. So this sequence isn't going to approach 1. And it doesn't approach 0 either because there are infinitely many 1s. And those are also a fixed distance away from 0. So you might think that this sequence of partial sums doesn't approach any value at all. And you would be correct. This sequence doesn't approach any number. And as a result, the limit as n approaches infinity of that sequence of partial sums does not exist. And since that's our definition of the infinite sum, this infinite sum up here does not exist either. So now we know that the infinite sum up here doesn't have a value because the limit of the sequence of partial sums does not exist. Now let's go back and look at the groupings that we talked about at the beginning of the video. If we group these pairs of terms, 1 minus 1 or negative 1 plus 1, this first sum gives us the answer of 0, and the second one gives us the answer of 1. So what goes wrong when we do the grouping like this? Well, both of these are also infinite sums. So we can use the same method that we did for finding the infinite sum up here. We can look at the sequence of partial sums and think about what that sequence approaches as n approaches infinity. So let's look at the partial sums of this first series. The first term in the series is this 1 minus 1 in parentheses. So the first partial sum is going to be 1 minus 1, which we know is 0. But notice that this 1 minus 1 gives us the first two terms of the original sum up here. So if we look at our original sequence of partial sums from this series, this partial sum is s2. It's that 1 minus 1. Now the second partial sum, if we add up two terms in this grouping, that's going to give us two groups of 1 minus 1. So we'll have 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. And that's 0 again. But notice that now from the original series, we have four terms. So this is going to be s4 down here. If we look at the third partial sum of this series, we're going to have three groups of two, and that's going to give us six terms. So we'll have s6, and that's another zero. So as we do this, look at the sequence of partial sums over here. The index down here, this subscript, is going to go two, 4, 6, 8, 10. It's only going to be the even index partial sums. We're never going to get S1 because S1 is when we just look at the first one in the sum, but that one is inside of a group, so we always consider it with the minus one. Similarly, we're never going to get S3 
because S3 happens when we cut off at this plus one. But when we group the terms, that plus one always has to be with the minus one. So we're going to skip every single odd index, partial sum, and that means we're going to skip every time the partial sum equals one. What happens here is instead of looking at the sequence of partial sums for this original series, we're looking at a subsequence, which means we just pick out some of the terms in the sequence and we ignore the rest of them. But of course, we can have a subsequence that converges to zero without the entire sequence equaling zero. Because if we look over here, adjust the even indexes, of course those are all going to be zero. And so if we look at this subsequence that's just the even index partial sums, that subsequence does approach zero, which means that this series right here, the one minus one in parentheses, plus one minus one in parentheses, and so on, this series does equal zero, no mistakes there. The problem is that this subsequence doesn't have the same value as the original sequence because the original sequence doesn't converge. The same thing is happening if we look at this second grouping. Let's look at the partial sums of this grouping down here. The first term here is just the one by itself. So that's going to be S1 because that's the first term in this infinite series up here. Now, if we look at the second partial sum in this series, we have the one, and then we also have this second grouping, which is minus one plus one. So that's going to give us a value of one, but notice that we've added up the first three terms of the original series. So this is S3. And if we add up the first three terms of this series down here, we're going to get minus one plus one and then another minus one plus one. So in total, we're adding up five of the terms from the original series. So this is S5. And if we look at this second grouping, the partial sums we're going to get are S1, S3, S5, S7, and so on. So we're only going to get the odd indexes we're not going to get any of the even index partial sums. So just like this sum equals zero, this second sum equals one. That's completely correct. But this sum is not the same as the original sum because we can have a sequence that doesn't approach anything and still have a subsequence that approaches a specific value. Now, after this explanation of why the grouping doesn't work in the case of this sum, you might start to lose faith in grouping. You might start to think, well, this must not be a valid method at all. But it turns out there is one case where we can use grouping and it will give us the right answer. And that situation is if the sum exists. So we can use some fancy math to prove that if the sum exists, if the original sum does converge to some value, then every grouping will give the correct answer. And the reason for this is that if we have a sequence that converges, then every subsequence has to converge to that same value. So if you know that a sum converges, if you already know that it exists, and your goal is just to find what it equals, you're totally fine to use grouping and you will get the right answer. But before you use grouping, you have to make sure that the sum converges. Because if you have a sequence that doesn't converge, it can have subsequences that do converge. But that doesn't give you the value of the original infinite sum. So that's what's going on with the infinite sum 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. If we look at this sequence of partial sums, we can see that it doesn't approach any specific value. But if we pick a subsequence of just the odd terms, then we get a subsequence that approaches one. And if we look at just the even terms, we get a subsequence that approaches zero. So this is a sequence that doesn't exist, but it has multiple convergent subsequences. And that's why when we want to group terms, for an infinite series, 
first we have to know that that sum actually exists. Thank you.